Hello good everybody and welcome to the newest episode of Simi Pro. I'm your host, Dalton Barrett. But you might know me better as Barrett Digital, and in the booth with me, I've got my good friend. Hi, I'm Josh Clemens. Or you may know me as Brit Edit. And today, Dalton, what are we talking about? I don't know. We didn't talk about it before we came on. We're going into this completely blind. No, I'm just Absolutely. kidding. We are talking about Twin Peaks season two. Um, which you really shouldn't be any more excited about. For this than you were for Twin Peaks season one because it's significantly worse. It's half. There's half of it that's significantly worse, and then there's half of it that's kind of the same. Yeah, I think the neat thing about season two is, um, it really everything that happens for the rest of the the series. You know, for for the movie and for the return, all has its basis in season two, uh, specifically with the finale. So, it's definitely important. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of it, it's still fun. It's still the same Twin Peaks. It just has some more moments where it drags. Yeah, those moments are typically uh, everything from episode ten through to like episode twenty one. Every time James is on screen, I want to James blow. So cool. I want to blow my brains out every single James time I see him. Don't James is so cool. Well, James has James always been cool. Always been cool. <laughs> Man, <laughs> stupid James. Uh, so, how do we want to go about this, talking about this? Well, okay. Um, so let's, let's just say again, spoilers, full spoilers for the entire series um, as we go into it. Uh, Spoilers for season one, spoilers for season two, quite possibly spoilers for season three. Who knows? Spoilers uh, for Fire Walk With Me, spoilers for... The Missing Pieces, <laughs> uh, the spoilers. three novels that I haven't read. Right, spoilers for David Lynch's personal life. I mean, we're going to be all over the place. <laughs> um, um, well, let's start with the the opening of the season, because season one ended on a, on a substantial cliffhanger, right. which was... It's milk. Right. Does Cooper get to drink his warm milk? The answer is no, because he gets no, shot. <laughs> um, so so Special Agent Dale Cooper of the FBI is laying on the floor, shot. And um, that's how we opened the season. Now, they, they used the number one cop out you would use in this situation, and I'm completely okay with it, because I didn't expect them to kill off Dale Cooper. Um, and turns out... Uh, he was wearing a bulletproof vest when he got shot. So good for Special Agent Dale Cooper. <laughs> he did a solid job of being shot. Uh, but yeah, so the the season jumps into it straight from where he left off. He wakes up in hospital. Uh, and he, he, you know, he knows who killed Laura Palmer, but does he? Well, he does says, he you know, he calls he calls her boy Harry. Who's great, by the way. I, I I can't stress enough. Harry's better this season than he is in season one. I can't stress enough how great of a character Harry S. Truman is. Not the Isn't president. Harry S. Truman. Right. He's he's the the you know quintessential American sheriff. And um, he calls Harry and he says, "Harry, listen, I know who killed Laura Palmer," and and that kind of sends us on this rabbit hole of a season um, where we do eventually find out who, who killed Laura Palmer, but we'll save that for like the very end of the episode. Cause that's really the last thing I want to talk about. Cause it kind of ties into next, the, the next discussion we do over fire walk with me. Um, yeah. So out of curiosity, are there any standout characters from this season? Uh, James, uh, the person <laughs> that she sleeps with the brother, who's not her brother and her husband who beats her. Right, because James is so cool. I meant uh, just just James. James's storyline is the worst in it, and I think that's probably the last we're going to talk about it because you don't need to because it doesn't matter towards anything in the series whatsoever. Yeah, he 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 he's fed up with this world, and <laughs> <laughs> he decides to to just leave and go on an adventure on his own uh, yeah, without telling anybody. Cool. It's incredibly boring because nothing happens. He works as a mechanic and then gets framed for a murder and runs away. That's that's the that's it. That's the show. And um, Big Ed, I guess, doesn't care despite the fact that he takes care of James. Yeah, um, 
and he cares about Donna, who James just ups and leaves. Oh, we're gonna talk about Donna. We're dedicating a, a whole, I, s- or not Donna, Nadine. We got, we're dedicating a whole section of this for season two, Nadine. I do want to talk about Audrey for a second, because Audrey yes. in season one was just kind of one of the side the high school characters. She was she, doing. She was flirty. You didn't know if she was good or bad. She was just kind of doing her own thing. Right. There was some really interesting character stuff with her dad, and she was really trying to get to the bottom of. Um, really get to the bottom of what was going on with the Laura Palmer stuff and, and really essentially because she had a crush on Agent Cooper. So she was trying to get to the bottom of it um, to help him out with the investigation. She finds out some nasty stuff about her own father. And, and that leads her to, to this season where it seems like her character has progressed quite a bit um, Mm -hmm. and really does. She got roped into that the prostitution ring, right? Where her own father nearly had sex with her, um, which was just beyond disturbing to think about. Which seems like a theme of this this series, I guess. But right. we'll, we'll we'll leave that we'll word now. That. We'll get to that in a bit. <laughs> but yeah, so her character in this season is really, really stand out to me, um, because she, out of all of the high school characters. Um, I like Donna enough, but she just kind of does things and then disappears. And James is just so cool. Um, and I definitely want to talk about Bobby because Bobby is my standout uh, of those high school characters from season one. I really like Bobby. Uh, but in this season, it's definitely got to be Audrey because she just um, she was kind of there in season one and you, you learn about her and you know her, but then in season two, she, she leaves it as one of the better characters. She's just so in your face all the time. And, and she's always just trying to figure new things out. Uh, they bring in a love interest who is Lex Luthor from, uh, <laughs> just as like the animated series. Um, yeah, it's super fascinating. And she's a really, a She's much better written. She seems to be one of the only characters that's much better written this season than she was in season one. I I, I wouldn't say okay. So my standout, it's not. I wouldn't say he's better written, but it's more of a you know consistently well written. Uh, it's 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 Leland. I love Leland so much. Leland just gets a lot more to do this season. Not that he was poorly written in season one. He just doesn't have much to do outside of mourn the loss of his daughter. Um, this season, he kind of... He, 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 he really advances kind of beyond that. Um, which, like I said, we'll kind of save this part of the discussion for the end. But he sort of advances a little bit beyond... Um, just his daughter is dead and he's sad about it to, to really kind of flesh out some other stuff, which is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really like him this season as well. I think he's, he's really well done. Um, I also think, like I said, I think even Cooper um, is, is one. I love Cooper in season two. I love Cooper in season one, arguably more. Cooper in season two, uh, about halfway through the season, just to kind of break down the plot a little bit, about halfway through this season, Cooper basically gets suspended from the FBI. Which... Right, well, okay. So halfway through the season, we find out what happened to Laura Palmer, and that whole storyline that was holding the thread together kind of unravels a little bit. Right. So they suspend Cooper from the FBI, and they bring in his old partner, who is now a serial killer, who he's been hunting. Uh, yes. So basically what happens with Coop and uh, his old partner is there was a case that they were working. This guy kind of lost his mind uh, because Coop was having an affair with his partner's wife. He was sleeping with his partner's wife, and his partner wound up trying to kill Cooper and killing her, and he's been on sort of this vengeful track ever since because he didn't manage to kill Cooper. Um, And it seems to be a bit of a coincidence that this guy makes it to Twin Peaks, but I'll forgive that because I really, really like that story. Uh, They basically frame it all up, and this is basically the second half of season two. They frame it all up like it's uh, it's a chess match between Wyndham Earl and Dale Cooper, Wyndham Earl being his his ex-partner. And it's (laughs) really well done how this chess match just kind of keeps going and going. And it's not like a figurative chess match where like, oh, there are, it's a battle of the brains. It's like chess. No, it's a figure. It's, it's a literal chess match. They're actually playing chess, but when Earl is killing people every time he makes a move, 
And, and so there, there's some genuine suspense in there with that because you don't know who he's going to kill. It could be literally anyone because uh, this show has shown that it's not all that afraid of killing off characters. Right, yeah. It, it's... I, I think a lot of people don't particularly like it. Um, I don't mind it. I think it's more just sort of... It's a step down from what we had before. Yeah, well, it's the whole thing of there's not necessarily a, a a literal antagonist of the first season and the first half of season two, and there is a literal protagonist of, you know, this later season. Um, and while it's not the same and it's not quite as good and they could have stretched out the Laura Palmer storyline further, I, I do like it. Um, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In, in any other series, it would be still praised maybe not as much as the first season of Twin Peaks is praised, but it would still be praised somewhat heavily because it still is super well-written. Um, and, and like I said, Cooper versus Wynne Merle is just such a fascinating story. It kind of takes a step back from the more supernatural elements that we had been seeing and brings it a little more down to the real world, which in the greater context of Twin Peaks, we'll find out next week or, or the, the, with the movie and the return um, doesn't make all that much sense. So in retrospective, it doesn't really work. Even the extent of Cooper losing his um, losing his his badge, his FBI badge, doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Well, the show kind of jumps from being you know X Files to Criminal Minds. Yeah, uh, very much so. But even probably a step down from Criminal Minds, because while Cooper is still an FBI agent. Uh, he loses his his FBI status, and um, Sheriff Truman just makes him a deputy. So now he's just a normal police detective. So it's yeah, more that, like it's more like it, it went from like uh, the X Files to Blue Bloods. <laughs> to yeah, well, it, again, that's the thing. The the storyline is where Twin Peaks falls apart because Twin Peaks has never been about its storyline. No, absolutely. Uh, Twin Peaks has always been about the characters and the people within the town and like you said I think we get a lot more of that this season which is it, it's better uh, in a lot of ways you get a lot of very racist stereotypes you get uh, <laughs> Andy and oh, I always forget her name Lucy Andy and Lucy I was going to say Lily Andy, Lucy and uh, Dick arguing about whose baby is whose <laughs> If the Josie Packard stuff in season one, which does continue to season two, by the way, and we will definitely be mentioning it. If, oh, the, jo- yeah. if the Josie Packard stuff from season one was the the stuff that made me want to, you know, fast forward to the next scene, then the Lucy and Andy baby stuff makes, oh, it's not quite as bad as the Josie Packard, but it, it just gets under my skin. And what's his last name? What is, what is ripoff Pierce Brosnan? Oh, you to my knowledge. It's <laughs> we just watched this too to show how uninteresting these scenes are. Yeah, I, but, but I, Andy, I love Andy, and even I, you know, it 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 loses me always. Uh, Tremaine, Dick Tremaine, and I like Lucy too. I think Lucy's a great character because uh, she's 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 a really good. Andy and Lucy are both really good comedy relief characters. But the whole storyline with whose baby is it and and they like adopt a foster kid or take care of a foster kid for like three episodes. And Dick Tremaine tries to convince Andy that the kid killed his own parents. Yeah, I, I forgot about that. Part. And they go and they tell Lucy about it. And Lucy's like, you seriously think that the kid killed his own parents? You guys are not fit to be a father. And it's like that but for half of the season and it just gets under my skin. Um, right. We find out that that baby though, that baby that Lucy is pregnant with, I want you to keep in mind while you're watching Twin Peaks season two, the next time you rewatch it, that child that is inside of Lucy is Michael Sarah. It's, it's young mom. <laughs> it, okay. Here's what's fascinating. It, Let's say hypothetically, because they never take a paternity test. Right. That could that could be Dick Tremaine's baby that turns into Michael Sarah. <laughs> I okay. 
before we talk any further about season <laughs> two, there's, there's a lot of things that season two does. Season two went from being eight episodes to 22, which is mm-hmm. one of many issues. But it's just as insane as season one is. It, it is just as surreal as the first season for the most part. I, 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 I am sure that we're going to dedicate a whole like 20 minutes to just the finale. I, I would, yeah, we, I mean, you almost have to, um, and you find some really neat stuff out about Bob and, and it's sort of like with the first season where if you try to figure out, if you watch through the first season for the first time and try to figure out who the killer is, you really can't because there aren't all that many clues because they didn't know who the killer was. They pretty much went into season two because the studio told them, uh, the network, I think it was, was it Fox that the show premiered on? I can't remember the, oh, the it network. Was, uh, Showtime. No, no Show- the original. Uh, when did, I don't know where the original appeared on. Yeah, same. I was going to say uh, Showtime didn't exist yet. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out here, here momentarily. But basically they told them you have to ABC. reveal who the killer is. ABC was the one behind it. Okay, so ABC said you have to tell people who killed Laura Palmer. You've got to. We we want we need that storyline to wrap up nicely, and so they did. And um, I think they went into season two knowing that, and so they 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 did sort of plant some clues as to who it was, and it does make sense. It's not like um, they did it, and it's like somebody who wouldn't make sense in the greater context of the whole show, and they just pick somebody and whatever. So they do set it up, and we learned a lot of neat things out about Bob specifically. Uh, and specifically uh, the killer's relationship to Bob and and where he kind of met him. And and it's super interesting just to to kind of figure all that stuff out. The thing that I think is lacking that the first season had a little more of is a little more of that that, that interesting, weird world. Because the only person we really get much of that from this season is Hawk. And Hawk is very much into that, you know, well, this is, and it's very much his culture, his Native American culture kind of says that these things exist. And, and, and a lot of the, the supernatural elements turned out to be based in uh, I, what I'm assuming is fictional Native American culture. I you don't know. are forgetting one element of it, though. What is that? That Hawk is not the only person experiencing these supernatural things. Brigadier Briggs. Yes, 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 yes. I'm not saying Hawk is the only one. I'm no, no, saying he's the main one. He's 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 the the channel through right. which you can understand. It, he's other people. Everybody's experiencing them. Hawk is the one who seems to understand them because they're they're based in his Native American culture. Like I said, I'm sure I'm sure it's a fictional Native American culture. Um, I'm sure this is not actually how. These things go for him, but <laughs> I'd assume not. I don't think the owls are what are not what they seem, right? Uh, but yeah, there, there's a lot. Like 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 we say, the first would you say maybe half of the series is kind of it's coop supernatural focus. It's all about who killed Laura Palmer. And it's exploring that a little bit more. Um, which do you want to do you want to talk about that for a bit? <laughs> the uh, the revelation. Which, yeah. I- I guess this is as good a time as any to 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 reveal who killed Laura Palmer. Before, um, before we get into that, I do just want to say that uh, Sh- Sh- I always forget the name. It Shirley, mm-hmm. uh, Shirley is insanely good. At yes, making you think that she is genuinely screaming for her life. Absolutely, um, and she plays dual roles in this series. She plays Maddie, who is Laura Palmer's cousin, and she also plays Laura Palmer. Um, right. And we find out what happened to Laura Palmer through Maddie, which is a nice little, you know, parallel. Yes, it, it's a, it's a, it, it's very, very, um, it, it's one of the only things that is sort of super horrific that we see in this show that isn't immediately followed by comedy or isn't something that is also comedic. The majority right. of the things that we see throughout this series that are these traumatic, horrifying events are either immediately followed up with something funny or are played for laughs themselves. Yeah, and this is... So, again, spoilers for <clears throat> Twin Peaks. If you are ever going to watch it, turn it off now and watch it. Uh, but 
Maddie's been haunted by Bob, which is essentially a demon, throughout the entire series since she's appeared. He, she keeps on seeing him pop up, she keeps hearing him, she keeps having these visions, and then ultimately we find out that Bob is possessing Leland. Uh, right. You know. Uh, we, we know that Bob is the one who killed Laura Palmer, um, both Laura Palmer's mother as well as Leland, Laura Palmer's father, are both seeing Bob, and then Maddie comes on the scene, she starts seeing Bob, and even Cooper sees Bob a few times. <clears throat> yes. And so all of these little little hints are placed all throughout the second season about where Bob is, how we find Bob. Um, Leland even goes as far as to looking at you know um, the, the detective sketch of Bob and saying, I know this guy, I've seen him before. When I was a little kid, he had a cabin that was close to mine, and he would always flick matches at me and would say, um, you know, fire, walk with me which is something that was was stated all throughout the first season. And so they they set up all these little details about who, you know, who Bob is and and we kind of get the idea that it is something supernatural, but we're still at this point not necessarily sure. Um the it, but we do find out through just just a horrifying disgusting scene that Leland is the one who murdered and raped his own daughter. And yeah. we find that out through him murdering his niece, who looks just like his daughter. Yeah, and it's... There's, okay. So I think it's fair to say that we're pretty jaded to most TV uh, and most sort of, you know, horrific things that TV... Like like Game of Thrones, when um, when Pedro Pascal gets murdered with fingers through the eyes in Game of Thrones, I didn't feel anything. It, it didn't affect me. But this is... It's so visceral... Uh, well, and it's the context too. The context yeah. of it is what, it, without if you just isolated that scene, it would be just generic murder scene. But it's from the '90s, so there's not all that much gore and it kind of you know whatever. But it's, it's also really freaky because like okay, so he like punches her and then he starts dancing with her like screaming body while she's trying to escape, and then he keeps on just punching her over and over again while continually dancing and crying and laughing, and it's just horrific. And there's and that, there's the scene. There's the scene where she gives up, and that's the one that always gets me. It's like oh, the yeah. last time that he, that Leland punches her, or Bob, I guess, uh, yeah. punches her, punches Maddie. She just gives up, and she quits screaming, and she just lays there. You can tell she's alive, she's still breathing, whatever, but she's just given up. And it's so disturbing, and it's so just gut-wrenching just to see this woman just completely give up on on the hope of escaping this man and Leland eventually kills Maddie and we learn that he is the person who killed Laura Palmer yeah and and uh, that is an idea that is explored much deeper and we actually get to see fleshed out in um, fire walk with me which is one of the reasons why uh, I think that that movie specifically is so much darker than the series is because that is quite literally what it's about and um like I said, it's one of the very few moments throughout all of Twin Peaks. Um, Fire Walk With Me is kind of its own separate thing, but the the three seasons of the actual show, this is one of the few moments that is dark like this, that we don't have it just played for humor. And so it does really stand on its own, uh, and it's genuinely just bone-chilling, um, The just the context of what happened. Yeah, yeah, and like even I mean I can't think of anything in that storyline that is played for laughs after either. Like um, like next episode doesn't Leland he he's taking Maddie's body out like to, to dump basically, and he gets pulled over by Coop, who doesn't know that he's you know killed Maddie, and he's just oh. like, hey, have you seen Maddie around? And he reaches around inside his trunk to get out his golf clubs, which are next to Maddie's corpse, and it's just so dark. Well, and. and- Maddie was supposed to be going home um, the next day, and it's just whenever Bob fully takes over Leland, which to to me, that seems like that moment. When he finally kills Maddie, it's like there's no more Leland. Bob is the only one left, and it's just his demeanor changes, and anytime he's on screen, it's just just serious, and, and you can just feel the gritty evil there. Um, and that's one of the reasons that works so well. Yeah, yeah, because they they know they know when to cut something for laughs, 
and when to admit that like yeah this is serious and we should probably just let it play out right and i i i think lynch definitely and we should we we should have probably started it by by talking about the the controversy that went on behind the scenes of this season <laughs> right <laughs> uh basically david lynch never wanted to reveal who the killer was which is admirable i really like the way it was handled um I- Especially if it was something that they were forced into, they they handled it really well. Right, and, and it's it, it apparently really kind of weighed on you know how how much he wanted to work on the show because uh, he's used to working on movies where he has full creative control, and so he's in this TV show and he's having to listen to the studios and all this kind of stuff. So, the about the second half of the season was uh, he was barely on set. Him and Mark Frost, the writer of the show, were barely there, uh, which caused some controversy with the cast. Um, Dale Cooper wanted his character somewhat changed. Kyle McCoughlin wanted the character of Dale Cooper changed quite significantly, which I would assume is why we have that of him being, you know, stripped of his FBI yeah, think, status. Well, he also, uh, he, he also wanted to cut the romance between him and, uh, Audrey because of the fact that I think when they, when she starts becoming infatuated with him, he, she's 17. Right. So you could make the argument that he groomed her. Um, and so he wanted that change, which is why in the la- latter half of the season, you get this new character, Annie, introduced, who becomes his love interest. Who is uh, also... Shelley's sister, I think? Or uh, Donna's cousin. sister. No, 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 it's not Donna's sister. Not Donna. Um, uh, it's... Nora. No, Nora, that's it. I was trying Norma. To think of, Norma's uh, sister, yes. <laughs> we, we've watched the show. Yeah. There are so many characters that it is really hard to keep track of everyone. We should have taken notes, but we didn't. Um, and he's also on the younger side, but that's a whole other <laughs> whole other discussion. But Kyle McCoughlin <laughs> didn't want to be typecast as this FBI agent, which is a big part of the reason he doesn't appear quite as frequently in the movie. Uh, he was supposed to have a much bigger role in Fire Walk With Me, but they kind of wrote him out of it quite significantly uh, because he didn't want to be typecast as this FBI agent character. So they do, they make him just a small town sheriff, which is really neat. And and I think all of the things that David Lynch was forced into doing, he handled really well. Um, But it did cause some controversy behind the scenes. A lot of the cast wouldn't work with David Lynch for a while after this, um, just because they kind of felt abandoned. Like he, you know, he wasn't there um, for them on the set. And and just a lot of stuff like that went down. Uh, But the stuff that he did and the stuff that he was able to manage and able to handle and do so well that he was forced into is really quite miraculous when you when you watch this this season yeah yeah um i think that's why people say that the season took a bit of a dive because there was a lot of disputes and uh controversy backstage uh, particularly between mark frost and david lynch who were kind of would you say the key to making twin peaks work I mean, they're definitely a big part of it. They got they got back together for the return, and um, while Fire Walk with Me was just Lynch, uh, for us didn't have much input on that, and it really kind of shows because it it's very different tonally, um, which makes sense given the story that they're telling in that movie. But for the return, the tone of Twin Peaks just kind of jumps right back into it, which is super neat, uh, and it's just really fun to watch. But yeah, I would say they're definitely. You can't, you can't have Twin Peaks without both of them. We talk a lot right. about David Lynch and his input and how great he is as a director of this show, but you really can't have Twin Peaks without the input of Mark Frost. Right, yeah. It, it, we shouldn't understate uh, his importance to it. Because, again, Twin Peaks is like lightning in a bottle. Absolutely. If it was these two and it wasn't... If everything didn't go the way it did, Twin Peaks would not be the phenomena that it is. If it weren't for James and how cool he is... <laughs> If it wasn't for James and that side story where he lives in a mansion and gets <laughs> named for a murder that he didn't do and then goes on a run and everyone forgets about it and then he becomes cool and he loses his hair. And he gets in a, a horrible accident where he doesn't talk much anymore. We're spoiling the return, Josh. I know, I know. Well, okay. So we've talked a lot about the season and I, we've talked a lot about David Lynch and Mark Frost and I think we can kind of move into why the finale is so great. We can't, because we haven't talked about Ed and Nadine yet. <laughs> Would you like to introduce Ed and Nadine and it is, how they work? It is my favorite subplot of this season because it is so friggin' weird. So there, big, are, there are four main players here. Five, five main players here. There's Ed, there's Ed. Nadine, 
Yes. There's Donna's Donna's boyfriend, who I can't remember the name of, Ginger. Uh, and there's Norma, and then her husband Hank, and that's all you need. That's all you need. Yes, Mike. By the way, Mikey. Mikey, that was it. Yeah, I always think of the one old man whenever someone says Mike. Yeah. Okay. So let's break this down. <laughs> so, in the finale of season one, and we didn't talk about it because it's not as interesting in season one. Uh, we did talk a bit about Ed and, and Nadine's relationship, and and how you can tell that he does really care about her, but he's not supposed to be with her. He's supposed to be with, um, with with Nora Norma, and, and and it's just this this really interesting love story that's that's a love triangle where the guy genuinely cares about both parties, and, and it's fascinating. At the end of the first season, because Nadine is a nut, because she's genuinely crazy, and nobody will buy her patent for um, silent oh. drape runners, because nobody will buy her, patter- her patent, she decides to commit suicide. So she puts on her princess gown, and this is why I'm saying like they tackle like genuine... Issues, you know, genuine but, issues, but they play them for laughs because she puts on her biggest, poofiest princess gown, sits in the floor, writes at a note, and overdoses on pills. Well, when she wakes up in the hospital at, at the beginning of season two, I don't even know how to, how to go about this. When she, she wakes I bet she <laughs> in high school. And she has superhuman strength. Let's don't oh, forget wait, the fact. I forget about the superhuman strength. <laughs> she has superhuman strength and she, she, she. It's somehow through the through the trauma, she's convinced herself that she's still in high school. And in high school, the only thing she ever wanted was to be with Big Ed. She had this huge crush on Ed. Right, which is why she ends up, you know, marrying him. Right. Well, she winds up <laughs> cheating on Ed. Well, okay. With Mikey. Now, before you get there, it's worth mentioning that the town lets her go to high school as a 40-year-old woman. Thinking that she's 16 years old again. Because the, you know, the therapist in the town says, we just need to kind of roll along with it. That's the healthy thing to do is to just let her believe she's in high school. He didn't have his golden shovel yet. No, he didn't. Um, so, so Ed, Ed, I guess technically is her legal guardian and acts as her parent because uh, he doesn't have children of his own. Enrolls her. <laughs> And pretends to be her boyfriend and rolls her in high school where she then cheats on him with a high school student named Mikey. Who seems to be okay with her superhuman strength uh, and even to a degree. I was going to say, not just okay with it. He likes it and he makes sure he mentions why he likes it. (laughs) And man, does it just get weirder and weirder from there. Uh, and right as Big Ed is about to get what he wants, you know, he's he's about to get her to divorce him so that, you know, he she can, can Norma. Right, he can go he can marry Norma and she can be with 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 Mikey and Mikey is also in love with Nadine, so it seems like that's going to work out. It's Norma, not like she she's infatuated with him. Mikey's trying to push her off all the time. No, he's he's into it. He likes it. Y- yes, like he actually says towards the end of the season that he's in love with her. And like wants to marry her, um, he genuinely cares about her, a- and to the extent where in the big you know finale uh, scene, which we'll get to and we'll kind of describe when we're talking about the last episode, something falls on her head, and Mikey rushes in there to save her, and 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 um, actually hurts himself in the process. Right as that's all about to go down, she's about to marry Mikey. Um, Big Ed and Norma are about to get together. She gets her memory back, <laughs> and then is and then it all just goes back to normal. Everything goes back to the way it was before, and yep. it's it, it's it's such a great fake out. We'll call it the F plot, like A B C D. We'll just go all the way down the list. Maybe like the Z plot of the series. Well, the thing, the, the G plot of the series is that Norma's husband Hank is back from prison. And he's already doing illegal things. Like he's he's already involved in Dude, all of the illegal instantly. Stuff. Yeah, like, like not even like not even like, oh, I'm gonna try and be legit, but oh I'm getting dragged back into his life. He gets back and his first thing to do is he finds Norma, goes, Hey, you better not be with anybody, because I still love you and you're still married to me. 
And then he goes and makes a phone call and he's like, hey, where's all the coke dealings happening that yeah. I can... <laughs> It's great. Um, but yeah, okay. So now that we got that out of the way, because I did, I just, I had to. That's my favorite plot because she's just in high school. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's so loving when she goes like, hey, I know that you're trying to care for me because you care about me and I love you like that too, but you should be with Norma because you love her more than you love me. And then she gets hit on the head and she back to normal. <laughs> yes. And she just goes and just hugs Ed. Cause that's the, you know, normal Norma. That's the person who, or, or normal Nadine. That's the person who she cares about. And, um, it's just gut wrenching for, for <laughs> Ed, like to put yourself in Ed's perspective, like to right, finally, I- I can't remember from the return. Does he get with Norma again, or is he still with Nadine? We'll save that for a return discussion. Uh, he's really- at the beginning of the return. He's still with Nadine, so it's not like they kind of leave that ambiguous at the end of the series. What's going to happen with that? But when they bring it back for the return, Big Ed is still with Nadine. Um, but we'll save that discussion. We'll 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 continue to follow the adventures of Big Ed and Nadine, which is a TV show I would absolutely watch. Um when we get to the return <sighs> but before we get to the return we should probably talk a bit about the finale mm-hmm. which is quite possibly the most incredible thing i've ever seen put to tv because it's the kind of thing that i would have never thought i've seen put to tv twin peaks the return and not like tv because when we say tv from a modern context we you know we think like you know your 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 showtimes or your your hbo's and yeah, and, like and, and west worlds yeah your breaking bads and your your better call sauls and 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 all of that kind of stuff no no this is prime time nbc the same network that airs you know just your your standard big bang theory and this episode of television exists as something that's part of that. I don't it, even it, know. It, when you start, like, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm waiting on you. Okay, so, <laughs> so they find a way to the Black Lodge. The Black Lodge, for all intents and purposes, is uh, hell. It's, uh, it's, like, if you I want guess. A translation, it it's it's another plane of dimension that Bob originates from. And we find out from Bob's partner that Bob is a being who exists to create chaos. He goes and rapes and murders and steals and just he exists as the most negative thing on earth. Like he he exists solely to create pain and mayhem. And that's the uh, the one armed man who is um, his name is also Mike. Philip Michael Gerard, which is super fascinating because there's a TV show um, called The Fugitive. And I do want to talk about this for just a second. Okay. So I want to talk about Mike's character because this is something that's just some really neat because Twin Peaks is somewhat referential into other stuff. And this is my favorite one. Um, Philip Michael Gerard was a character in a TV show in the 1960s called The Fugitive. And he was uh, essentially a man who was framed for a crime. He was a, a, an F, uh, an ex-FBI agent who was framed for a crime. And now he's running from another FBI agent known as the One-Armed Man. Uh, and so this idea that Philip Michael Gerard, who is the One-Armed Man in this, is running from himself because he's possessed by this demon is such a neat little behind the scenes thing that, that David Lynch threw in there because the whole plot of the fugitive it's, it's a super generic 50 show, but it's this man running from the one armed man as he tries to prove himself innocent. And, and this just parallels that so perfectly, but he is both the one armed man and the guy you running sh- from the one armed man. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, it's I super fascinating. I've seen a few episodes of The Fugitive that I've just picked up in like reruns. And so when hmm. I heard that name, it was so familiar to me. I, I, I looked it up uh, and, and found that out. And it's genuinely interesting. And he's he is sort of tormented with himself. He takes this medicine um, to to just die, you know, kill down, uh, put away these these urges and, and this other personality that comes when um, when the demon takes over as we kind of figure out some more about the black lodge and, and how to enter it. And the, um, the, the story with Cooper's ex partner kind of takes us there because he's also looking for the black lodge, which was a bit weird. Um, but the, the second half of the season pretty much is 
how do we find our way to the Black Lodge? Right, they, they, the, what, what do they call them? The Bookhouse Boys? Yes, the Bookhouse Boys. Yeah, are, the, <laughs> the, the Tree, the Tree House Club. Right, they, the, uh, the Codename Kids Next Door. <laughs> they, they find out how to get to the Black Lodge, and it's, it's like, you have to go to a certain part of the woods on this certain night, and hope that everything comes together. And all of these, like, million to one things that they find out is going to happen next week. Uh, and as it turns out, Windermere has captured Annie, the person that Coop is currently romantically involved with. He's he's kidnapped her, and he's taken her to the Black Lodge. And he's like, hey, if you want to get her back, you'll have to come to the Black Lodge with me. And so Coop, Harry, and I think Hawk go to the entrance. And Coop's the only one who actually goes in. He's the only one who walks into the Black Lodge. Everyone else sits out waiting outside. And it becomes the most surreal thing I think I've ever seen. Because we've seen the Black Lodge throughout. Right. I mean, we see it as early as season one. Episode. Right, right, in the first episode. But we don't really explore it all that much. And we see these little hints of all of it. But actually being in there, in the red room with these red curtains and the chevron floor. And and, uh, and it's so eerie. And everybody in there just speaks in this backwards speech. And it's 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 so suspenseful. And it's just so unnerving. And we spend so much of this episode, the finale of this show, there. It's at least half of the episode. And we don't really know what's going on. Cooper, he'll stand up and he'll try to walk to a different room. And the diff- all the rooms look the same. Yeah, um, and there's another Cooper that's also running through. And you don't know if you're just seeing hallucinations. Doppelganger. Yeah, exactly. You have a little dwarf. Um, <laughs> That's what they call. Yeah, they call him the dwarf in the show, and then Harry asks, "Any relationship to the giant?" It's great. Um, yeah, but ev- eventually, so after it's really suspenseful. It's just twenty minutes of building up of going through this like maze and getting lost, and eventually, uh, Coop finds Windermere and Bob, I think, right. and they're standing next to each other, and Bob in reverse draws fire out of Windermole's head. Yes. Which I always took as him stealing his soul. Uh, yeah, I would see that. Um, but yeah, and then this is the, the show that it gets, uh, what's it, ep- uh, strobing lights. Uh, everything starts flashing. People start screaming. The music builds up. And Coop and has now got these like, iridescent blue eyes oh, and he's they, just laughing with bob they, and it's like a cackle they they remind me of the 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 eyes from the evil dead the dead eye eyes from yes yes from that and it's 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 just unsettling to look at and 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 basically um dale cooper starts running away from this doppelganger of himself and he just starts running and running and running and running. And eventually um, he he escapes the Black Lodge, or so we think. Um, and it's been days at this point, right? Because Harry yeah. and, and Andy were waiting there forever. And I love the scene because you have all this creepy, eerie stuff. And, and Andy and Harry are just sitting on this log watching. And Harry's so stressed out. And Andy goes, would you like a cup of coffee? And, and Harry goes... Yeah. <laughs> and then he says, how about a piece of pie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he just keeps asking all of these questions about what he would want. And here he just... And that, uh, um, Harry at this point has seen his girlfriend turn into a doorknob. <laughs> we, we didn't even mention it. We didn't even mention Josie Packard turning into a doorknob. It's Joyce a had a gun. Harry yells, put it down! And then... <laughs> And then he, she turns into a doorknob. She turns and into a doorknob. Ever. That, ever. That, by the way, I'm not paraphrasing there. There's no in-between scenes that I'm intentionally leaving out. That is the events that happen, and no one talks about it, ever. <laughs> well, no. Harry, walk with me. Harry gets really drunk in the next episode. Right, that's about it. And that, says, she didn't have to die! And then that's it. It is, it is something, uh... But then, yeah, Coop, Coop comes out. It's been days, and he's like, I need to use the bathroom. And so he <laughs> wanders into the bathroom. Bob's now his reflection. He smashes his head against the window. And 
just starts repeating nonsensically, how's Annie? Yeah, and we never figure out how Annie is. I could only yeah, assume she died. She was never rescued. Uh, they don't mention her. Well, she well when when Cooper reappears out of the the Black Lodge, out of the Red Room, Annie is laying there on the ground next to him. They both come out together. Oh um, yeah, yeah. And, that. and they say in the last episode that she's in the hospital, but we never figure out in the return uh, if she died or if she lived or. Um, or any of that. She does appear in Firewalk with me, but we'll get to that in the next time we talk about Twin Peaks. Um, right. And I, I, I think it's worth mentioning that that's that's when the episode ends. And yeah. then that that's all people had for 25 years. Well, no, we had Firewalk with me like two years later, but... Firewalk with me doesn't answer any future questions. Right. Firewalk with me is a prequel series, so we don't really figure anything out other than the fact that uh, Cooper is stuck in the Black Lodge and his doppelganger is walking amongst the earth. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's, uh, one of the greatest cliffhangers probably ever put to screen. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, I don't know. I, I it, it's hard to even wrap up a discussion about it because the show itself doesn't really wrap up. Uh, oh, Lucy does choose Andy to be the father of her child. Um, yeah, so we do get uh, that conclusion. Audrey gets killed in the bomb accident. Oh, we got to talk about that because that's how the, um, that's right before we get the the coop cliffhanger. Audrey Horn, she's going. What is she trying to figure out? She's hard. Uh, God knows. I mean, we didn't even talk about Ben, who's a Civil War general. For oh, okay, yeah, we're going back to talk about Ben throughout the season because I love the Ben Horn stuff this season. But Audrey is working for her father. Um, and this is, it's a really neat way to develop the character of Ben Horn. Um, cause in the first season, he's just this really seedy businessman who's, who will, will literally do whatever he can to, to make his business succeed, including, you know, uh, pimping out young women. Um, right, exactly. And so we, we see all this stuff happen and, and in this season he kind of snaps, like he just sort of loses his mind. The death of Laura Palmer really did a number on him. And um, he loses some land in a business deal, and his brain just snaps. And because of that, he um, <laughs> because of that he thinks he's a Civil War general uh, for about half the season. And we just see this keep advancing and advancing and advancing. And Dr. Jacoby, who's the therapist of the town, says something along the lines of what he's basically doing is He's taking his real life losses, and if he can win the Civil War for the for the Confederate Army, he can show that he's a man again. You know, win over his own mind. Right, exactly. And he does. He does this, and it just keeps. It starts really slow with him like setting up little, little like but toys he, on the floor. Well, he just he starts like talking like Civil War. I was like, gentlemen, we must go on. But he's doing it sort of in the context of like. He's setting up a little Civil War reenactment on his floor, which people genuine, you know, people who are interested in that do, like these little miniature. Like, that, that just kind of, like people like Warhammer, you know, it's just a little hobby. Um, right. And then it devolves into him grabbing bags of sand and dirt uh, and building a battlefield. I mean, eventually his whole office is turned into a battlefield and he's got like fake horses and curtains and, and costumes and everybody's playing along and whatever. And then he finally wins the war. And when he does, he comes back. But when he comes back, Throughout the second half of the season, he doesn't seem like this this evil guy. He seems like you know he starts eating yeah. better. There's there's he genuinely he cares about Audrey and wants her to do like be okay. Yeah, the, there's a really neat thing, and I don't know if you picked up on it, but throughout all of the first season, and and the first half of the second season, he keeps cigars inside his his jacket pocket, and he'll pull out a yes. cigar and he'll he'll yes. he'll snip it and he'll start smoking the cigar when he's talking business. But in season two, it's celery sticks and carrots, and so he'll pull out a celery stick out of his pocket and start munching on it because his health he's he's caring about his health and he's caring about other people and secondhand smoke and all that kind of stuff. So he his character does a complete 180 through this story of him thinking he's a Confederate war general, um, and and he comes out the second the or the second season of Twin Peaks as a genuine pretty good guy 
Um, and so he's trying to stop the land development of this place. And at first you're thinking, well, is he trying to do it because if they don't develop it, he gets the land back? Or is he trying to do it because he genuinely cares about the environment? Because that's what he keeps saying. You know, if we don't do this, it's going to be a detriment to the environment. And it turns out by the end of the season, he genuinely wanted to to he genuinely wanted to do it because it was an environmental hazard. And so and, and it's so fascinating. And that's what happens with Audrey. She gets kind of roped into this and she goes to the bank to keep them from withdrawing the money that would let them do that. And she chains herself to the to the bank vault. And then uh, Pete and what's his name? Oh, uh, I I know the person you're talking about, and I can't remember. Well, anyway, they go to open the bank vault, and there's a bomb inside their safe deposit box, and it blows up the entire bank. Right, and, and that's um, what we see. Right, that's all we see. That's the finale. And they don't even really touch on that in the return. They do a bit, um, but not all that much. And it's Again, it's, 99% of the show ends with you going, and then you don't get an answer for 30 years. Yeah, and even then, sometimes you don't get an answer, um, which is part of the charm, I think, of Twin Peaks. Is there anybody else we forgot to talk about in the finale that has... Uh, uh, no, Andy Andy gets the kids. Uh, uh, oh, um, Catherine, who owns the sawmill uh, right. that Laura Palmer is found outside of, she disappears in the start of season one because there's a giant fire there and people assume that she's killed. But instead, she's in horribly racist makeup that she's using to trick Josie, who's also being pimped out by someone in San Francisco with like an extra guy who likes to fight people. There's a lot going on this season. I mean, we barely, we didn't even touch on the fact that David Duchovny plays a uh, trans, uh, transsexual, uh, which, by the way, for the 1990s, they they were very. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Progressive. Yeah, they're very progressive. Like they they handle this. Uh, David Duchovny plays an FBI agent who worked with Coop. Uh, I think his name used to be Dennis. Yes, he used uh, to be Dennis, and, and now, now he's Denise. Denise. Right. Yeah, and it's like he comes in and he's already you know he looks like a woman, and Coop doesn't judge him or anything, and they just go, "Oh, you're a woman now. Good for you. I'm happy you're happy." Let's move on. And they don't, there's never any jokes at my, the expense there's, of there's the one. transsexuals. There's one. There's and it's that? one of my favorite jokes, not at the expense of, of him being a, a transsexual, but just probably my favorite joke from the entire series is when uh, they're talking about ladies because Audrey Horn is in, is in <laughs> Coop's room and he has to kick her out because he doesn't, um, yeah. he doesn't want her there and she doesn't realize that uh, Denise is a man. And so she comes mm -hmm. up and kisses Coop and uh, and then leaves just to like you know just to kind of you know control her territory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mark her territory. <laughs> and then she leaves, and Coop says something along the lines of you know like something like I think it'd just be easier if I were <laughs> if I were like you or something about you know not not <laughs> needing women. And then Denise goes. Well, I still like I still like to play ball every now and then. You know what I mean, Coop? And Coop goes, <laughs> "No, no, Dennis, I really don't." And then like shuts the door on him. And it's my favorite joke from the whole series because Calvin uh, Coughlin's delivery of that line is so perfect. It's so sincere. He, he he's not joking. I just no, I don't, Dennis. <laughs> and it's so great. That, um, that's the second. That's the second best line in the series. The first is when. We find out what Gordon Cole's plotline is this season. <laughs> oh, no, we didn't talk about Gordon Cole. Gordon Cole. Oregon. Uh, Gordon Cole, just really quickly, has a crush on Shelly. Shelly, yeah. Uh, Gordon Cole, of course, has these comical earpieces, so he can't hear, so he yells every line. And Shelly comes up to him and she's like, hey, do you want some pie? And he goes, <laughs> I, can, I, I can hear you. I understand you. You don't understand. I've been wearing these hearing aids for 45 years. And then I, then she asks if he wants some pie. And he says, Copious amounts of pie. <laughs> Shelly, I wrote you a poem. He, he exists in this show, like this series, pretty much entirely for the Shelly plotline. <laughs> I mean, honestly, yeah. Um, Maybe we didn't we, a show where he falls for the prettiest girl in town. We didn't write or, or write. We didn't talk about um, Bobby 
and right. and Shelly with um with uh, and Leo are, Johnson. Yeah, um, and which I don't is know that we horrific. really need to, but it's pretty horrible stuff. Which is part of the reason I don't like Bobby as much this season. Um, right. uh, although Leo Johnson is a scumbag, the stuff that they do is just kind of like it's played for laughs, but it's also disgusting. It's as bad as the stuff that he did. I wouldn't go with as bad. And he gets pretty abusive towards Shelley. Yeah, no, I would say this probably isn't as bad as as what Leo was doing, because it's not like they made him a vegetable. We should specify. Leo Johnson they- gets shot. And when he wakes up, he he's a vegetable. He has no upper brain function. Um, so they basically say, well, if we keep him at the house with us, uh, we'll get his... Um, we'll get the, the security. We'll get like the his, checks. Yeah, for his, the his stuff. disability checks, and we'll keep him here, and we'll just live off his disability, and we'll be fine. But then they put him in like party hats and force yeah, feed him they, cake. They, they find out that the disability checks aren't that much... Uh, and like Shelly's taking care of him full time. Meanwhile, Bobby's out partying and stuff, and so she gets really tired of it. So they just have parties at their place where they they put him in party hats and smear him in cake and just make fun of him constantly. <laughs> which which is disgusting. Right, but um, he's also a serial abuser and coke dealer. Right, um, it, like it is disgusting, but it's not quite as disgusting as Leo Johnson beating Shelly. Um, right, because <laughs> like it's not like they made him into a vegetable, you know. Um, he kind of made his own bed, uh, his yeah, own bed yeah. of lettuce, if you will. But um, but there, there's so much in this season that we yeah. are like, if we wanted to talk about every little thing that makes it great, we would be here for the next five episodes. Um, yeah, we really can't. Um, we can't really talk about everything. I mean, we've already talked for almost an hour, so it, it is time to wrap this up. Yeah. Um, yeah but we haven't really scratched the surface of season two um season one is a whole lot more concise season two has a whole lot more going on and is super enjoyable for its own reasons uh i don't think it's quite as enjoyable as the first season but it's still super it's still fun good. The, I mean, the finale is worth it all right the finale is worth sitting through you know the james all, the james, all the james all the james if you are going to watch it and you didn't care about spoilers and you've watched this far like i said last episode anytime james is on screen just pull out your phone and uh play play a game and then you know check your emails whatever and then when he's gone just click it off stick it back in your pocket and get back into the into the show and that makes it much easier to watch season two but you want to close this out here josh uh yeah thank you very much for listening to us ramble on about twin peaks season two and join us next week when we choose to talk about twin peaks fire walk with me which is i haven't watched it yet but as Dalton has told me many times one of the most horrific things he's ever seen <laughs> i mean you're right yeah <laughs> uh in a great way um but yeah thank you very much for listening and we hope to see you next week